Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us all rise. We begin with the responsive prayers. Is it nothing to you all, you who pass by? They seek after the life of the righteous man. They divide my clothing among them. With cruel blows, they pierced my hands and feet. They gave me gall to eat. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. O God, the Father of all humankind, you allowed your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be made a spectacle to the mob, to be mocked and beaten, to be nailed to the painful cross, and by his humiliation, you revealed his majesty and power. Make us, we pray, both to behold the man and to worship the King, and to give him all our heart's adoration even the same, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Savior of the world, who by your cross and precious blood have redeemed us. Let us now sit for the lessons. The first reading is taken from Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 1 to 12. Please turn your pew Bibles with me to page 637. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich 
at his death because he had not he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth verse 10 yet it pleased the lord to bruise him he has put his him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Our second reading is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25, found in 1041 in our Pew Bibles. Verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but extorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Please remain seated for the Passion but when we get to the verse where Jesus is taken away, I will be asking us to rise. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ is according to John chapter 19, verses 1 to 37. John chapter 19, verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted the crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man! Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you 
has a greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold, your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And so he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Let us all rise. And Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among, they said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now, therefore, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished and the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. And they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has testified has seen, has testi and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. 
And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. This is a passion of our Lord. Let us now be seated as we listen to the sermon. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you for telling us that you love us, not only with words, but with action. That you went to that place called Calvary so that you would give it your life for us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us as we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord. I praise God that I am able to share to you a message about Good Friday. Growing up, we loved to watch movies. And one of the things that I observed growing up was whenever we watch movies, have you ever noticed that the leading character always get away with certain troubles or problems? For example, in a gunfight, crossfire, it's always the leading person who is still alive. And then we would argue with my brothers, with my parents, why is the leading character still alive after all that had happened? And our parents would tell us, of course, if namatay yung bida, it's a bad ending. No more story. It's a bad ending whenever the leading character dies. But have you ever noticed that the Christian faith is not like that? Even if our leading character by the name of Jesus Christ, even though he dies, it is not a bad ending. Just like in our movies, there are certain movies, even if the protagonist or the leading character dies at the end, it does not mean that it is a bad ending. Especially when the leading character would give his life for another person. It has a good ending. That's why it is called Good Friday. Good Friday is called Good Friday even though our Lord perished because the reason for His death is our life and reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. I'd like to zero in one important detail with the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the torn curtain. The torn curtain, which is found in Matthew 27, 50 to 51, in the epistle reading that we read earlier in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Allow me to read this detail. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, it was torn in half. What does the torn curtain mean during Jesus' time and to us today. Hopefully, I'll be able to answer that question and give us this profound detail in history of what, does, what it means that the court curtain was torn. The temple curtain in the Old Testament, Exodus 25 and then 26. I hope you could, I could have your full attention as I explain some historical detail about it and hopefully we don't get bored. There are three areas when it comes to the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a tent. Tent where it is portable. You could go to many places so that people could worship God in that place. And inside the tabernacle are three areas. The first one is the outer courts, which is outside of the tent. It is where the priests would offer sacrifices, such as sin, guilt offering, fellowship offering, all the offerings. It is the job of the Levites and the priests to offer sacrifices in that area outside of the tent. And when you enter the tabernacle, the first room that you will be entering in just one door, which is the holy place. It is the holy place. The holy place, it has three furnitures or article of furnitures. Number one is the golden lampstand. You could, maybe you could see the picture there with... Uh, Letter U, that is a candle. That's a golden lampstand. It must keep on burning. It must not go out. It gives light 
to the holy place. The second furniture is the altar or the table for the bread of presence, which fresh bread is being baked every week by, and it's to be consumed by the priest, by the priest only because it is a holy bread. And just a trivia, these two, golden lampstand and the table of the bread of presence, two of these were fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ. The golden lampstand points to Christ being the light of the world. And the table points to Christ being the bread of life. And the last one is the altar of incense, which in every morning and every evening, they would offer sacrifices that is pleasing to the Lord. That is the holy place. The holy place, parang lobby. But there's behind that, there's a small chamber, a small room, which is called the most holy place. And found in that most holy place is the Ark of the Covenant. The very presence of God. And on top of that Ark of the Covenant is what we call the mercy seat, where God sits on His throne. In other words, the most holy place is the presence of God. Now, what separates the holy place from the most holy? holy place. This is where the temple curtain comes in. According to early Jewish traditions, can you guess how big the temple curtain is? Kahit naka-flash na sa screen natin. Estimated, it is 45 to 60 feet. If you try to estimate this in our height of the church, this is not 45 feet. This is, I think, less, if I'm not mistaken. Imagine 45 to 60 feet curtain with 30 feet long or wide, yung, yung width. Ganun kahaba. Ang laki pala in that picture, could, that could be accurate. Ang laki pala nung curtain. It's not just a curtain that is small or, ang laki pala, it's enormous. And it's four inches thick. Four inches. Uso ngayon sa curtain natin yung malilipis. So that may konting ilaw kahit pa paano. In their time, four inches ang bigat nun. Very heavy. And it was made of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. And finely twisted linen. In other words, it's not just a cheap curtain. It's very, very ex expensive. And again, the purpose of this curtain, this gigantic curtain, was to use to separate the holy place from the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant in the mercy seat is located. What does this mean to the people at that time and even today? I'd like to share the first point, Good Friday message number one. The untorn curtain symbolizes the separation between humanity and God. We cannot enter the holy, most holy place. Only one person can enter the most holy place, and that is the priest. And can you guess how often should the priest come in in the most holy place? Just once a year, in the Day of Atonement. Once a year lang. And he should bring a sacrifice, he should examine himself. Scholars would say that he should bring incense so that there's smoke in that place, so that they would not see the Ark of the Covenant. He would not see God, lest he die. Others who say that the priest would be tatalian sila sa bewang ng tali so that when they die, they could pull him out if they have made a mistake. And anyone who's not supposed to be there went into that place, he or she would die because that place is holy. The curtain in the temple served as a constant reminder that we are unworthy to enter the presence of God. We are unworthy to enter the presence of God because of our sin. No matter what we do, we cannot enter the presence of God. For those who uh, get to high school and even to college, we have what we call clearance. So before you end a particular semester, or even before you graduate, you have to fill up those clearance. I'm sure you're going to relate I mean, clearance. 
So you will go to certain offices, you go to the business office, you go to the academic office. You have to settle everything before you can graduate, before you could proceed to the next semester. You have to be cleared of any debt. In our seminary, isa sa mga clearance namin is the canteen. You have to have no utang sa canteen. Kailangan bayad yung utang mo sa canteen. Even if you are a dean's lister, even if you are cum laude, suma cum laude, magna cum laude, if hindi mo nabayaran yung canteen, you will not graduate. You have to clear that. In other words, may utang ka pa rin. You have to pay for that. In other words, that is our position in God. May utang tayo kay God. No matter what we do, we cannot pay for it. That curtain symbolizes the separation of man from God. But here's the message I'd like to share with you. Good Friday message number two. We praise the Lord because Christ's death tore that curtain between God and man. From top to bottom, that giant, that thick curtain was miraculously torn apart by our Lord Jesus Christ because of His love for us. Allow me to read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 20. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have the confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is His body. The body of Christ parallels to that torn curtain. Just as the body of Christ was torn, the temple curtain was also torn so that we can now enter the most holy place can now have that connection with God once again through the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. The curtain was symbolic of Christ as the only way to God. Just as John chapter 10, verse 7 says, the, I think the fourth I am of Christ, I am the door of the sheep. Just one door, no any other door. Anyone would come out to the other walls or that is not the shepherd. That is a thief and a robber. Not only is Jesus our good shepherd, He is also the only door to the sheep. And He is the ultimate sacrifice, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. That's why we don't need to offer any more animal sacrifices to God today because it was ultimately paid by our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate sacrifice. And He is our great high priest, our representative to the holy God. I'd like to share what Gregory of Nazianzus says. Jesus began his ministry by being hungry. Yet, he is the bread of life. Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty. Yet, he is the living water. Jesus was weary. Yet, he is our rest. Jesus paid tribute or taxes. Yet, he is the king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. Jesus wept, yet he wipes away our tears. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, just like the message last Wednesday, yet he redeemed the world. Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death. There is no other explanation or other way to tell us that we are loved by God other than the passion that we have read earlier. That Christ went through that for you and for me. There is no better I love you than Christ giving His life for you. And lastly, for our Good Friday message number three, because Christ tore that veil, the torn temple curtain symbolized the entrance of humanity to God. Yes, we now have the confidence to enter that room 
the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, we now have the confidence. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 21 to 25, as an application, the author gives us three let us. The first let us, we are challenged to be confident to always approach God, for He is our Heavenly Father. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. The second, commitment. To cling on to that promise, to that hope, to that commitment of God to take care of us. Let us hold fast to the hope that we profess. And lastly, to find a community in this church. Let us stir up one another towards love and good deeds and not giving up in meeting together. We praise God for what Christ has done. We are now reconciled with our Heavenly Father. We have now entrance to Him. I challenge you, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us come to the presence of God. How do we do that? How do we come to the presence of God? We come through His Word. When was the last time that you really spent reading the Word of God, the Bible, by yourself, all alone, closed door, just by yourself? You just want to spend time with the Lord. How about in prayer? When was the last time that you prayed and you have not noticed the time? Because it flew so fast. Because you were having so much wonderful and meaningful time with the Lord. When, when, when was the last time that you have attended our fellowship, our worship service, to have bonding time, to spend time with fellow believers, to learn more about the truth of God? So I challenge everyone. God says, I am a prayer away. Anytime. Anywhere. We can approach God anytime, anywhere. We can come to Him whenever we need Him. And we can come to Him as a son or a daughter would come to its father to spend time with Him. So I do hope this Good Friday, I'd like to summarize the message. The untorn temple curtain, it symbolizes our separation because of our sin. We cannot enter the presence of God. But because today is Good Friday, we remember the death of Christ that tore that curtain. We are now able to enter the presence of God. The torn temple curtain symbolizes the entrance of humanity towards God. And just like to clarify that this is not by our own strength, by our doing. It is only to the finished work and perfect character of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can enter the presence of God not because of what, how good we are or how good we might think we are, but because of how good and how Christ has given His life for us. I always remind myself that I am not holy. None of us are holy, but we are made holy. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. We are made holy to the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you because he went to that place called Calvary. It is by his own will, own decision to give his life for us. Thank you for spelling, I love you by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, for us. Starting today, Lord, may we have that confidence. May we have a renewed perspective that, Lord, what a great privilege to be able to enter your presence. That the curtain is no longer here to separate us from you, but it is now torn. We can now enter your presence. Thank you, Lord. And we await on Sunday for that glorious moment when Christ ro rises again from the grave, proving himself to be the Son of God, the Son of Man. Thank you, Lord.
and we give to you all glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless us, everyone. We thank the Lord for His reminder for us this Good Friday that how He has opened the way for us to Him and so we can find rest and comfort and all these wonderful things in Him through Christ. As our response, may I invite everyone to please rise as we sing hymn 196, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us now kneel and pray. After each item, we will have a moment to pray for the item mentioned in silence. First, let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for our diocesan bishop Rex, our bishop-elect James, and the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm His church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace.
Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for the Republic of the Philippines, our president, and all who serve us in public office, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, namely for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in His mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of His love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Let us also commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. Let's pray for ourselves. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new 
and that all things are being brought to their perfection by Him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us be seated. As we prepare for the veneration of the cross, uh, our choir has prepared an anthem for us, coming from John 3.16, uh, entitled, For God So Loved the World.
As we do the veneration of the cross, I would be requesting everyone to uh, face the cross as the crucifer or the acolyte bringing the cross moves forward. He will be doing three stations. And after each station, when he says uh, the, the sentence uh, he's assigned to say, we will respond by saying, O come, let us adore him. May I now invite everyone to please rise as we face the back towards the cross. Behold the cross of Christ, on which the Savior of the world was hanged. O come, let us adore him. Behold the cross of Christ, on which the Savior of the world was hanged. O come, let us adore him. Behold the cross of Christ, on which the Savior of the world was hanged. O come, let us adore him. O Savior of the world, who by your cross and precious blood has redeemed us, We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. If we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Christ, for us, became obedient to death. Together. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let us now be seated for the offertory. We will be having our offertory in silence.
Let us all rise. Let us now sincerely and prayerfully say these words. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Let us now kneel for the Lord's Prayer. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us now pray together this concluding prayer for our service. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls. Now and in the hour of our death, give mercy and grace to all, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. We may remain kneeling as we continue to reflect, and the service will end in silence. <laughs> 